morning, everyone. Welcome to worship today. We're continuing in our series for the joy of it. And the title of our message today is ministry. We'll be looking at Philippians 2 verses 17 through 29. Everyone hearing this message today is a role model to somebody. I don't care who you are. Somebody looks up to you and takes their cues about life from the way you live, whether good, bad, or indifferent. And in the book of Philippians, in this ch second chapter, Paul is going to introduce us to three role models. First of all, himself, the Apostle Paul, who's a role model for us in the life of sacrifice. And then young Timothy, Paul's disciple, will show us how to live a life of service. And then a man whose name is kind of hard to pronounce, Epaphroditus, will teach us about suffering. Role models in sacrifice, service, and suffering. And we begin with the Apostle Paul, because verse 17 begins with him. He says in the 17th verse, as he writes to the Philippian believers, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. The words glad and rejoice are found twice as Paul is talking about sacrifice. Now, I don't know about you, but I think the words glad, rejoice, and sacrifice don't usually fit together in the same sentence. It's almost a disconnect. And I want to just take a moment to before I explain to you what this passage means and relate to you a truth that I think is worthy of taking a moment to talk about. Now, I don't know what you say when people tell you that they don't come to church because there's so many hypocrites in the church. And when we hear that, here's what we say. And, you know, if you're shaking your head up and down, I know you're agreeing with me. We say something like this. Oh, you shouldn't watch other people. They'll disappoint you. Keep your eyes on the Lord and he'll never let you down. I mean, isn't that what we say? It sounds good in a way. It's in, in a way it's true, but it's also flawed. First of all, the only Christ any people will ever see is the Christ that's in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And secondly, the Apostle Paul in this passage sticks a fork in that whole deal. He tells us it isn't true. He says you can't get away from godly living just by saying, don't watch me, watch Jesus. And the, the Apostle Paul actually said the opposite. He said to his followers, watch me. Now, I know that's a pretty scary thing, that we're role models to somebody. That somebody looks to us, that somebody wants to know what this Christian thing is all about. And since they think we claim to be Christians, they think they can pick it up from us. And one of the things we need to realize about this Christian walk is it's more caught than taught. People catch it more than they hear it. So what we do as role models is really important. So let's talk about Paul first and his selfless role model for us. First of all, Paul was selfless in the discipline of his own life. And verse 17 is a rather complex verse that we might not understand unless we dig a little bit deeper. We read it before and it said, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Now, when we read that, we may think, what in the world does that mean? It's full of Old Testament information. It's about a sacrifice in the Old Testament. And here's what Paul's talking about. In the Old Testament, if you had come to watch a sacrifice, you would have seen the Jewish worshipers come and they would have killed their animal and they would have put their animal on the altar to be sacrificed to God. But at this point, they would add something else to their offering. It was called a libation. They would take a cup of wine, and while the altar was white hot for the sacrifice, they would take the cup of wine and pour it on the altar, and in a puff of smoke, it would disappear. So what Paul is saying is this. I know you're worried about my situation, for he was in prison and could be executed in any moment, but he said, my life is not the important thing. It is your faith that really counts. Your faith is the main offering. My life is just a drink offering that's poured out on the end, and it's not really that important. And in an age where everybody is promoting themselves and everybody's trying to become somebody that they're basically not, Paul is giving us this role model. 
He viewed his life as very unimportant when compared to the spiritual needs of the Philippian believers. He was filled with joy when he remembered his tireless labor on their behalf. And yes, he was in prison, and yes, he may be executed at any moment, but to Paul, that was just a drink offering. The real sacrifice was to the ministry of the church and the Philippian believers to whom he wrote this letter. Secondly, Paul was also selfless in his discipline of others. You see, Paul saw his friends in Philippi as worthy of the best that he had. Here's something interesting. When Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison in Rome, and Timothy had been sent to him by the Philippian church to bring encouragement to him. And while Timothy was there, I'm sure Paul really enjoyed his fellowship, whatever that could have been. But Paul understood that the church in Philippi needed Timothy's leadership. So at his own expense, he dispatched Timothy and sent him back. Paul was not only to willing to give up his life for the Philippians, but he was willing to let go of his protege from whom he loved as a son so that the Philippian believers could grow in their faith. And speaking of Timothy in verse 22, Paul says, But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father he has served me in the work of the gospel. See, Paul had put his arms around this young man. Timothy was learning to be a leader and a teacher of the Word of God who would ultimately become the pastor of Ephesus. And Paul was disciple in him. He was considering him to be like his own son. And Timothy was able to catch the gospel from Paul. He watched him, he walked with him, he was in war with him, and he saw everything that was about being a true leader and a spiritual leader. And Timothy was becoming Paul's disciple. Paul was selfless in the discipline of his own life. He was just a drink offering. He was selfless in the discipline of others, and that included Timothy and the Philippian believers. And he was selfless in determining God's will. Now remember, he's in jail. He doesn't know if he's ever going to get out, but he wants them to know that he wants to come and see them. And he mentions that he's going to send them Timothy, but he mentions it in a very interesting way. In verses 19, 23, and 24, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. And then in 23, he says, I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I can see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Paul measured everything in his life against the will of God. And as Christians, we need to take a cue from Paul. Listen to what he said. He says, I hope in the Lord. I am confident in the Lord. In other words, the Lord and I together are making these decisions, and we need to see that. Paul, For Paul, everything was about his relationship with Christ. Everything was about making sure people understood that God loved them and that he was willing to give up everything for that gospel. So next, let's take a look at Timothy, his model of service. We just read about him in the beginning of verse 19, because Paul writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. And then here's what he says about Timothy. And this kind of sounds like something on the back cover of a book. He says, I have no one else like him who would show you genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not just for those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven character, that as a son has served with his father with me in the gospel, therefore I hope to send him at once. Paul was responsible for Timothy becoming a great follower of Christ. And once Paul was on his second missionary journey, he encouraged Timothy and enlisted him to join him as his helper. He said, I have no one else like him. Paul was saying, Timothy is who I am in a different body. He represents my values. He represents my core. And I'm sending you Timothy because I can't come myself, but I'm sending you the best thing I can, not being able to come myself. There's nobody like him. And then he said in verse 20 that Timothy would show genuine concern for the Philippian believers. Timothy was naturally concerned about these people. How did Paul know that? He knew that because he knew Timothy and he knew Timothy's heart. And oh, what a joy it is to get to work with somebody who you know has your heart, who represents yourself. And when you were put in a crunch, these people were asking and criticizing you. They could speak for you, and you know that they'd speak honestly and fairly. 
and you're safe in their hands. Timothy was a guy that Paul had like that. He was a good man and a model of service. And one last person before we're done, and that's this guy called Epaphroditus. He's a model of suffering, and he teaches us one basic lesson, that life and ministry is not easy, and it has never been and never will be. Because here's what Paul wrote about him, beginning with verse 25. Paul says, but I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and he almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me to spare me the sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Now, all of this thing is going on between Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus. Paul is in prison and the Philippians are in Philippi. And they send Timothy and then he comes back. And then this letter, we know that the book of Philippians was delivered to the Philippians by Epaphroditus. Paul sent Epaphroditus back. And he carried the letter back with him. And the Bible says that when Epaphroditus came to be with Paul, while he was there, he got really sick. In fact, the scripture describes it as he almost died. And what's going on in Rome, where Paul is, is that the word has gotten back to the Philippian believers. And they're full of anxiety because of their brother, Epaphroditus. He's over in Rome, and it looks like he's not going to make it, and they're worried. And Epaphroditus hears about it, and he's worried that they're worried. And so Paul says, I'm going to send him back to you so that you can check him out and see that he's okay. And when Paul spoke of Epaphroditus, he used some words to describe him in the text. First of all, he called him brother. That's one of Paul's favorite names for Christians, brother. And we need to know that if we are a member of the body of Christ, we're a brother or a sister. If you come to know Jesus as your personal savior, savior, all other people who are in the family are brothers and sisters. They belong to you and you belong to them. And in this hearing audience today, we have a whole group of brothers and sisters. Isn't that something great? And the Bible says that Paul spoke of Epaphroditus as his brother. In fact, he uses the word nine times in the book of Philippians. And then he calls him somewhat, something else. He calls him a fellow worker. It's another phrase that Paul likes to use, and he uses it several times. Paul says, Epaphroditus is my brother, and he's my fellow worker. And then he says something even more important. He's a fellow soldier. How many of you know that it's not just enough to be a worker in the field? As we're serving Christ, we need to be a warrior too, and especially today. If you get into the ministry today, do not think it's a walk in the park. I'm not here to complain. I love everything I do, but I would not, I wouldn't want to do anything else with my life, but I'm here to tell you that it's not an easy task. Paul championed Epaphroditus because he was not only his brother, he was also his fellow worker, but he was a fellow soldier. He soldiered on in the faith and stand against the strategies of the devil. These three descriptions of Epaphroditus point to a man you can understand was really important to Paul. And in his service to Paul, Epaphroditus suffered. And the Bible tells us that he was sick and almost sick unto death. And the phrase, he risked his life, that comes at the end of this verse, comes from this strange Greek word called parabolimini. And it's only used this time in the New Testament. And it means not regarding his own life. In other words, Epaphroditus bet on his own life. He gambled his life to fulfill the work that God had called him to do. You early Christians, those who risked their lives for Christ and the world, and it's interesting because the word actually meant a gambler or a risker. Aquila and Priscilla would have been members in this group. And Paul wrote about them in Romans 16. He said, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Jesus who risked their own necks for my life. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I've not been asked to do that, as I'm aware of. But I do feel, knowing what's going on in the world today, that we're going to be coming closer and closer of being asked to do that than we've ever been. In the culture in which you and I live, it's getting less and less comfortable to be a Christian, less and less acceptable to be a follower of Christ. Let's not speak of it out loud too much according to the culture or you will not be accepted. And where we're at at one time was a mark of a good person that they went to church and that they knew Christ as Lord and Savior. Now it's become almost like the first critical thing people say. Sometime along the way, God may ask you to gamble in the right way on who you are and who Christ is. And that's what Epaphroditus did. He put his life on the line. He did not know if he was going to get better or not. He knew that God had called him to do, and he needed to do it, and he did it. Let his life be an afterthought. But this man named Epaphroditus also had great sympathy for the Philippians. For it says in verse 26, he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. So there you have it. Three examples. Paul, who showed us how to live life selflessly. He's a drink offering on the sacrifice. And Timothy, who served Paul, and there was no one like Timothy. And he had left Paul in Rome and went to minister to the Philippians and served them. And then there's Epaphroditus this gambler who risked his neck for the gospel. And he was a brother and fellow worker and a soldier. And these three men are men we can look to and say, I can learn from these guys. I can learn how to become more like Christ by watching these guys. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this message, that something that's kind of convicting, if you know the truth, is that we're all role models. We must ask God to help us understand that that is true. Someone is watching us. Someone is trying to observe us and see how we do. We're all being watched. You see, what we do matters. How we live counts. We may not like it or want to accept the responsibility, but as your pastor, God has called me to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I'm trying to do that this morning. We need to get to a place where we understand that we have a decisive role in the lives of people around us, our families, our neighbors, and the people we work with. We are Jesus Christ to them. The only Christ they will ever see is Christ that they see in us. We may not like that. We may not feel like that's fair, and we may try to wriggle out from under that, but I'm telling you, it's true. It's true for me, and it's true for you. And so I pray this week, God, that I want to be a better role model for my family, for my children, for the people I lead in this church, for my neighbors and my friends. And I want you to pray and ask that prayer for yourself. God, help me to be the person you want me to be so that when others see me, they'll be drawn to you. That's what our goal should be. That's the ministry all of us are called to serve in, that we will draw people to Christ as we live his life wherever we go. Is it a tall order? No, not really. It's not a tall order. Is it impossible? Yeah, somewhat. It is impossible, but that's why we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to you and to me to help us do the impossible. We can't do this ministry on our own strength, but the Spirit of God who lives within us and gives us lives, our lives for him, we say to him in the morning, Holy Spirit, control my life today. Show me to do the things that I don't normally do. Help me to get outside of myself for a life of service and a life of sacrifice. I'm no special person. Help me to do it for you so that you would be the person that's seen in me. That's what happened with Paul. That's what happened with Timothy. And that's what happened with Epaphroditus role models for Christ. So go and love and serve the Lord in ministry as people are watching you to see Christ in you. Have a great day, church. Enjoy. Feeling good, like I said.
good When in Durga walk around the neighborhood Feeling blessed, never stressed Got that sunshine on my Sunday best Day can be a better day despite the challenge. All you gotta do is leave it better than you found it.